Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to have you with us today to the eighth annual LaFonti CEO Summit and LaFonti Awards. I'm Jenny Ellis. I'm going to be your host this evening, and I can see a few familiar faces, so I think we're going to have a fantastic evening tonight. Well, we have a great lineup for you to celebrate the excellence in business, enterprise, and philanthropy, and also with the LaFonti CEO Summit Roundtables, where we have a great list of speakers. Um, who I will introduce you to in just a moment. We'll look at the key risks CEOs are going to need to consider when it comes to 2019. But first of all, a little bit more about our organizers for this evening. So tonight's event is put on by Milan-based LaFonti. Now, many of you will already be familiar with the great work this research institute, independent publishing house, and now live streaming TV channel after all, I'm told the Italian for LaFonti means streaming spring water. And thanks to the dedicated work their journalists in 125 countries worldwide do. Well, LaFonti's live streaming broadcast is now viewed by over 1 million online visitors, including business leaders, managers, and investors. And we will have an audience tonight. A, a thriving business community contributes to the success of LaFonti's television broadcasts on a regular basis and includes internationally recognized economic and financial decision makers and almost 10% of Fortune 500 companies are LaFonti's top clients. So you're in very good company tonight. And the LaFonti Awards from Milan here in London, Dubai, Hong Kong, New York, and Singapore. They're focused on the global economy and sustainability in industries reaching from the green economy, alternative investments, asset management, forex, ETFs, property, um, and the list definitely goes on. So it's very important to have institutions such as LaFonti, particularly in these times of uncertainty and political uncertainty, that we're certainly seeing worldwide today, and especially here in the UK at the lead up to Brexit. So this is exactly why I've chosen the subject for tonight's LaFonti CEO Summit Roundtable. We're going to be looking at the challenges, like I said, CEOs face both disruption and innovation, and then we're going to be looking at the macro picture as well. But before we get started, it just remains for me to thank our judging panel that collaborated with the LaFonti Awards for the selection process. I know their job certainly wasn't an easy one. And finally, many thanks also go to our media partners that contribute to promote the LaFonti Awards all over the world, such as the Harvard Business Review, The Economist, and Arabian Business. So now to kick things off, I'd like to welcome to the stage the president of LaFonti, Mr. Guido Kaomi, to say a few words. Thank you, Jenny. Um, we are live now for the Italian channel and the English channel. Uh, just a few words. Uh, I'd like to thank you and welcome you all for being here tonight. This evening will be awarded the best in class for leadership in London. Uh, it is a great honor and a pleasure to invite you all for now our next Global CEO Technology and Innovation Summit but will be held in Hong Kong on March uh, next, uh, next year. In this, uh, in this World Conference, we will examine the call for technology and uh, innovation in time of global exchange. Our LeFonti magazines, our innovation and technology cross-platform, and our uh, all-news streaming live television provide a unique chance to interact direc directly in real time with the readers and business technology community, like I said, Jenny, in uh, 130 countries. Uh, thank you, you all, and uh, please uh, enjoy the event. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to have our first panel discussion. So I want to invite my first three speakers to the stage. It's about sustainability and disruption. So let me introduce them as they come on up. So Susan, Rob, and Daniel, you want to come to the stage? So first we have Susan Freeman, who's the partner of Mishcon Dorea. I know we have a lot of lawyers in the room tonight, so you probably recognize the name. She's ranked in BizNow's 51 most influential women in UK real estate list as the woman who knows everyone, so you will be tested on that. 
And Susan is an active member of a number of property-related organizations, including the British Property Federation's newly formed Technology and Innovation Group, and she chairs the Future PropTech Advisory Group. She's on the advisory board of Seaforth Land and Flexible Working Company Worklife. So our next speaker. So we have Robert Ellis, and he is the founder of EProp Services, and that falls under the umbrella. It has the companies such as Fine and Country, the Guild of Property Professionals, and Easy Property, as I'm sure you recognize as the brand with Stelios. Rob also acts as a strategy consultant for a number of global companies, including India's largest property developers. He's the founder of Hallingbury Finance and is about to start the fundraising on a £200 million REIT. So I hope you've brought your checkbooks tonight. And then finally, we have Daniel Godfrey, who's the independent director and advisor. Now, he's the former CEO of the Investment Association the trade association of the UK asset management industry, whose members collectively managed some $8 trillion when he founded the Investment Forum. He's a non-executive director of Moneybox, a fintech startup that enables people to round up their digital spare change in the long-term equity funds and of the big issue invest fund management. He's a social impact investor. He's also a senior advisor to Ermi's Investment Management and the principal of Positive Peace Capital, a division of the Sydney-based Institute for Economics and Peace. Right, so let's start. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so starting with tech and disruption, I just wanted to start with a, kind of a quote. So Clayton Christensen popularized the term disruptive innovation in his iconic book, The Innovator's Dilemma, which was published in 1997. Now, the phrase describes a specific way that smaller companies can outcompete and eventually destroy their bigger rivals. So I'm thinking of examples like the Amazon of this world, Netflix, the streaming TV channel or company, and also Boohoo.com, which was a very small little Manchester-based online retailer, and now it's gone global. So these are the kind of companies we're talking about. So I want to start by putting to my panel what disruption means to you. Daniel, why don't give you go first? Well, that's a, it's a good <laughs> question. I don't think that, personally, I don't think disruption does mean things like Netflix. I'm not sure what ne Netflix has destroyed today. We still have TV companies. We I still have Blockbuster people, might uh, argue people, with you there. People, but <laughs> people still go to the cinema. I think it, there was a view that no one would go to the cinema anymore. I think what we're learning from that is uh, that Things that you used to pay for, you now get for free, hmm. uh, like music, like, like movies. But it doesn't mean that people won't pay to enjoy recreation. So they will pay for convenience. They pay for immediacy. They pay for curated content, so people selecting content for you and delivering it to you. So I'm not sure that disruption is just new technology. Yeah. Um, the business I'm involved in, Moneybox, uh, people ask us if we see ourselves as a, as a disruptor of traditional savings businesses. And we say no, because nobody is actually trying to get young people to save in the way we are. Yeah. So we're not disrupting anybody. Mm. In fact, we're bringing new people into the market to offer the funds that the traditional fund providers offer to older people. So uh, I think disruption is a very specific thing. Clearly, Kodak was disrupted. Yeah. Blockbuster was disrupted, but I'm not sure that disruption is as broad as people think. Well, it's almost become a fashionable thing to say that they're disruptors in the market. Rob, what would you say to that? What's disruption to you? Uh, well, I think certainly in the property industry, disruption has been a, a term that's been bounded around probably for the last 15 or so years since the property portals actually came into the marketplace. And of course, that wasn't actually disrupting property, but it was disrupting the marketing of property and how you would advertise properties. So the newspapers and the traditional methods got, got really phased out and have been phased out over that period. Over the last four or five years, we've seen businesses like mine with online estate agency coming in and, and be deemed to disrupt the traditional estate agents by cutting the fees out of it and making it a lot cheaper to transact properties by using technology and doing so online. So I think in that case, we have seen massive pressure on traditional estate agency fees, and they've come down by upwards of 40% over the last three years alone. That is a, a, a real disruption to that marketplace when the margins are relatively skinny anyway. And we're now starting to see those traditional businesses going out of business. So in my world, disruption certainly is happening. And, and as 
uh, Susan knows, and, and I'm sure we'll say in a second, but there is a massive amount of technology now coming into the property industry, which has been so sorely needed for so long, and now is just about hitting the, uh, the world, and everyone is out there trying to raise money for new prop tech startups. So, Susan, yeah. for you? Yes, I mean, and it, it's interesting, actually. Things have actually, I think, changed and, and, and moved on, even in the last couple of years, in that um, people aren't necessarily seeing the disruptors so much as a threat, and one's actually getting the big incumbents, the big corporates, um, wanting to work with the disruptors. So rather than saying, no, you know, they're going to come and take us over, they're saying, let's work together. So you've got venture capital funds like Fifth Wall in um, California, who are actually bringing the big property companies together with the startups and saying, right, you know, here are the problems, let's see if we can work together. So I think that's an interesting new um, development. And of course, I think on the, on the back of that, you're also seeing a, a amalgamation of the services. So so services that the disruptors are bringing to the market are now being adopted by the traditional guys, and, and the gap is narrowing in the middle as to, to who's actually offering what service, and, and now they're having to bring in this, this, this disruptive technology, which is now helping the, the traditional businesses as well. So what do you think of the mistakes some um, big companies make when they don't adapt to this? I want to use the example of BlackBerry because, I mean, that was, you know, the leader years ago, but now no one has a BlackBerry, even though some people do miss them. So, Daniel, you know... What's the, what do you think they did wrong, and, and why did they not sort of go with the market? Well, it's always easier with hindsight, but they didn't see the, the iPhone coming, I would say, pretty much killed the BlackBerry in the, in, in the end. And uh, I think BlackBerry's mistake, if it, with, with that benefit of being able to look back, was probably believing that the iPhone would never be a business tool, yeah. that it would be a personal piece of personal technology and not a business technology. Uh, and I think possibly the iPhone and then the iPad, uh, where there was nothing like that for business, is what sealed the uh, BlackBerry's fate. Uh, and it's interesting because I think that originally the creators of iPhone and, and iPad didn't necessarily see it as having that uh, business application. Uh, but people wanted it because it looked good, um, because it worked more easily. Um, and so they wanted to be able to use it for business too. And so sometimes it's hard to predict uh, and say, well, we should have seen that coming. But clearly, I think that was BlackBerry's uh, fate. So what do you think companies can learn from that then? Do you think they need to be more open to what's coming on the market? I think they probably need to bring more diversity into their companies so that they have people who are thinking differently from the tra traditional thought processes operating in the company, bringing in younger people, people with different skills, different experiences, understanding of the new technology that's coming uh, in order to try to plan ahead and not assume that tomorrow will look more or less like today. Yeah. So then talking about more diversity and let's move on to governance issues then and a big thing we're having at the moment in companies is the lack of diversity on boards, the lack of diversity in uh, management, high management positions. Susan, do you think that's really holding back companies or do you think it's something that is now starting to be addressed? I think it's, it is beginning to be, um, to be addressed. And uh, I was on an interesting panel a couple of months ago where we were talking about diversity, but the direction you know, from the chair was we're not going to talk about gender. Um, and we're, not, uh, we're, we're actually going to talk about diversity of thought because I think the tendency is to say, OK, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get 50% men and women, but you might get men and women that have been to the same schools, have the same background, so you're not getting... It's not really taking you much further other than sort of ticking, ticking boxes. So I, think, I think Daniel's right. It's actually diversity of thought, encouraging people... I mean, for instance, real estate has not been terribly good in terms of getting women in, people from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. and you have to do that because otherwise you, you know, you're stuck and you, you're, you're carry on doing things in the way you've always done things. So it's different ages, it's different backgrounds, different different ethnicity, really. But Daniel, I mean, we've been talking about massive companies, but do you think diversity is an issue for all companies, or is it just those big companies that make the headlines when they have bad? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, I'd agree with, with, with you. I think it's, it is all companies, but it's more than just about men and women. Um, it's about ages, educational backgrounds, um, nationalities, it's about having people with different perspectives mm -hmm. so that you don't get locked into what we call group thinking, where everyone just agrees with each other. Um, and I think you wouldn't have been able to form the businesses you had if you were 
thinking in a traditional way. Actually, estate agent, you know, the, the real estate business is quite interesting because it's probably much more diverse in terms of um, the status of people's background than, say, a lot of financial services has been. Uh, but it has been very male dominated. Uh, and it has been uh, quite old as well. Yeah, I'm not uh, sure actually mm. I agree with you because if you actually look at the people running those companies, mm. they've all been to the same schools and the same universities. Um, and I think we could probably do, um, we could do better yes. on, on that. Sure. But I think there's been research that actually now shows that uh, corporates that actually have a good mix of men and women and, a good, and good diversity actually are more profitable. So yes. I think that's a move in the right direction. It's actually quite funny because when, when I've looked at my business, especially with Easy Property, and you're, you have a very traditional sector, but you're bringing techies into this, and you're getting the techies to deal with a very traditional way of working and, and people, and having that sort of demographic on the board is actually quite challenging because they are very different people <laughs> from very different backgrounds, and trying to get them to... Yes, you have the, the advantages of having those, that diversity, but you've also got a lot of challenges with it as well, of, of getting that communication and understanding of each other's wants and needs and, and way of, of living and working. Do you think that you need a certain amount of conflict to uh, actually achieve change and innovation and creativity? Absolutely. So you have to go through the pain yeah. barrier a little and it, bit. And to, it is painful. Um, yeah. I think it's, it, it's also a case for a good chair yeah. of a board. Yeah. Uh, so clearly you need to recruit for a board people who can work together as a team. Yeah but it absolutely shows how critical the role of the chair is to ensure that everyone uh, has the opportunity to have their views heard. Because, in fact, you probably want some people on boards who are not as extrovert uh, as others, um, who have a great deal to contribute, uh, but need to be uh, encouraged by the chair to do so. So what other issues do you think CEOs then need to be thinking about now in terms of governance? Rob, I'll put that to you. I think it's, it's a very changing world, so there's all sorts of, of governance issues. Um, the list is endless currently with, with everything that we've got going through. But, but certainly, you know, we were talking about, uh, I guess it's sort of governance, but we were just talking earlier about the, the way of merging uh, some M&A businesses together and how that works and, and getting a, a good balance within that process. Um, and in particular, when we come back to the, the diversity issue again, where you have got very different businesses smashing them together can be incredibly challenging, um, very rewarding, as we've, we've all agreed, but incredibly challenging to get that right. Uh, I would absolutely agree with the, having a, a strong chair is essential, and having a weak chair can be absolutely disastrous in that whole process. So, um, yeah, board structure, I think, is, is a definite challenge. Yeah. And to you, Susan? Well, I was going to say, I think if I, if I was the CEO of a company, the thing that would actually be keeping me up at night is cy cyber security. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's something, you know, we deal with a lot in the office and actually seeing what's going on and the, um, you know, the, the problems that it causes for, for, for companies if they are hacked and if there's a problem and there are the data issues and they, you know, stand to be liable for fines and to be, you know, have all sorts of responsibility. And it, it just seems that everybody's system can, can actually be hacked and, and that corporates are very vulnerable to that. So, I mean, that's something that would really bother me if I was running a company. And we're seeing some issues at the moment with British Airways when it comes to data problems. So you can see the sort of far-reaching effects this kind of thing have, has. So, Daniel, what else yeah. do you think is well, CEO should I, consider? I think I'd, I'd take it uh, a bit out of the day-to-day the -day and say that I think that CEOs are under an enormous amount of short-term pressure to deliver short-term results. And I don't think most people went into business because they wanted to hit quarterly earnings forecasts. They wanted to build businesses. They wanted to create wealth. And actually, that's why investors commit capital to businesses, is to create wealth sustainably yeah. for themselves, for their children, maybe for the community as well. And of course, creating wealth is a benefit not just to uh, companies, their employees, and their shareholders, but also uh, to communities and all their suppliers. So I think for a CEO, it's how do we um, work with our, all the people who are our bosses, our, uh, the, the investment bankers, the financial media, uh, the investment consultants, the investment managers, to persuade them to let us run businesses, to invest for the long term, to create wealth in a sustainable way, 
because otherwise we're shortchanging that capital uh, in a world that needs that growth, that sustainable growth, to deal with climate change, to deal with inequality, um, without which uh, we seem to be heading in quite a, a frightening direction. I think this raises also the issue of ESG, which has become a buzzword. And while well, I work in the asset management industry and environmental social governance, it's it's bandied around. But I mean, how much do you think it's something that it's a tick boxing boxing exercise for people that they don't really, you know, they're not really engaged with it, but it's just something they feel they need to do at the moment. Well, in the in the short term, environmental, social, and governance issues, mm. which is what you mean by ESG are not going to be risks that affect you tomorrow or the day after. If you're looking 5, 10, 15, 20 years into the future, these risks will definitely affect you. So yes, until people start looking longer term, they will only really um, be pretending to do what they have, do the minimum that they can get away with, uh, and will have to focus on short-term delivery. So there's a big industry being formed to present uh, what we're all doing about carbon footprint, about diversity, about uh, modern slavery, and so on. Um, but we need to think longer term in order to really make the difference. Mm -hmm. Do you think that even if it is just a tick box uh, exercise for the corporate, their, the younger people working in their organisations are so committed to that. I mean, it's their, it's their future that they are going to actually push that agenda even if the board yes. aren't pushing I, it. I think it's not just younger people, actually. I think that, the, but I, I do agree. Mm. Um, I think we, we're told that millennials care about the environment. I think, uh, you know, people getting older with children and grandchildren care about the environment that their grandchildren are going to grow up in. Um, so I do think that it is making a difference, but it's a bit like the human brain that works at 5% of its capacity yeah. most of the time. I think we could achieve a lot more if there was a, a, um, a focus where the incentive was to get it right, uh, rather than the incentive being to do the minimum necessary. And sometimes it's very hard to even measure how much of an impact you're having. How do you measure social? I know with the data issues, but it's not like there's not a, a measure you can put, so there's no benchmark there. So how do we, companies even go about that? Well, there are emerging ways of developing it. So the Global Impact Investment Network has uh, produced, uh, has had a global um, uh, working group to, talk, to think about uh, social impact uh, assessment in uh, developing economies. Uh, there are ways of assessing, obviously, carbon footprint, of assessing the, um, the amount of jobs that are being created and so on. So the, the danger is it becomes just a, an industry to help people show what, what they're doing rather than really helping drive more positive behaviours. Yeah. But yes, there are ways that are, are emerging, and I think that they should get better if we're lucky. Yeah. And Rob, from a sort of boots on the ground perspective, is ESG ever a consideration for you? I think it's always a, a consideration. I think the difficulty is when you are in a startup mode or you are looking at small businesses, it's very difficult, you know, even partic in particular, to get the diversity and you know, you're so restricted by what you, you, what, the, what you have available to you at that time. So I think it's much harder to, to bring in, although the big thing that we've got to be aware of is, is if we are trying to concentrate on that, we don't want to get into a red tape type of scenario and start trying to handcuff businesses' growth by concentrating on areas that they should be naturally working on and, and feeling that that is the way that they want to take the business. It, it, as you say, I think it should be encouraged rather than legislated for, uh, in a lot of ways, if it can be, as much as possible anyway. And I think that is the big key for sort of smaller businesses to, to take that forward. Okay, well, I'm going to ask for your final thoughts now, really, because to sum up, because we are running out of time with this panel. So, Daniel, why don't you go first? Yeah, I think uh, I'd, I'd, I'd just... Uh, take that, that, that thought you just had about not regulating for it. I think the point here is that <coughs> the longer term your time horizons and your objectives are, the more that this just becomes a, uh, an integral part of proper risk management. And so you would do it, not because people are complaining that you need to do it, but because it's, it's how you ensure <coughs> that your business will be sustainable for the long term to create wealth for you and everyone else associated with it, not because you're being told to do it by someone else. Yeah. And Susan? I think um, 
My final thought is that uh, short-termism has a lot to answer for. I mean, just looking at some of the problems that the retailers are getting into at the moment, and they're blaming online. And actually, it's not online. It's short-termism, which is sort of coming back to hit them like 20, 30 years down the line. So I think if, um, if, if companies are able to be longer-term and they're not forced by their stakeholders and shareholders just to you know, concentrate on the profits for the next year, then, then that would be a lot better. Yeah. And Rob? I think, again, just to pick up, up on both those points, the, the interesting, or certainly in my experience, the interesting part is going from a business where you're totally in control of and you run that business how you want to run it with your cash, your employees, your everything, and then to suddenly take private equity money in and the influence of, of external investment, the drive for returns, the drive for growth, often more, certainly in a startup and in, in the tech world, but that push from from investors, external investors, makes you react very differently to, to necessarily the way you would have done if you were growing it with a longer term view with your own money and, and the way you would be building a business on a generally sustainable slower growth pattern. But when you do have um, expectations from funds, from private equity houses that are pumping money at you and saying, make it pay, there is a, a real stress within the board and, and within business decisions in in how you actually keep that sustainable um, model going forward. Yeah. So yes, let's uh, give my panelists today a big thank you with a clap, and yeah, you can, <laughs> you're free to go. <laughs> so if you want to just give the mics away, and then if you want to go for a picture, oh, we just need to. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Photos and then we'll get them. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, you just need to swap over mics and then we're going to have our next panel. Thank you so much. Really good job. Okay, so just bear with us a few minutes. So while they're micing up, I'm going to explain to you who our ne next panel is. So now we're going to be talking about the macro, you know, what's Donald Trump been tweeting, what's going to happen at Brexit. Do you even care in Europe about Brexit? We certainly do. Um, so let me introduce you to my panel, and they're going to come up in a moment. So we have Mike Ingram. He's the chief market strategist for WH Island. Um, his city career spans nearly 25 years. Michael has advised some of the world's largest institutional and hedge fund investors. During his tenure, he's worked for banks such as ABN AMRO, HSBC, Santander, and RBS, in addition to one of the world's largest interdeal brokers, BGC. So, Mike, come up, take a seat, have a bow. Um, next up, we also have Francis Coppola, who's a leading financial blogger and commentator. You've probably seen her in Forbes magazines, and she's a, you know, she's a, a renowned speaker. And she's had 17 years working in banks, including HSBC, NatWest, UBS, etc. Now, she was designing systems that enable bankers to lend, traders to trade, and back office finance and risk management functions to deal with the messes they create. So when she says loan accounting works like this, she does because she designed the systems that do loan accounting. And this sometimes gets her into hot water with economists who have different views of how loan accounting works. But she's pleased to say the Bank of England agrees with her. So <laughs> we believe her. So Frances is now a freelance writer and speaker, and she's a contributor to Forbes and the Financial Times and writes for a range of industry publications. So Frances, come and take a seat. And finally, we have Alistair Winter, who is the chief economist at Daniel Stewart & Co. Alistair, he, the Daniel Stewart & Co. is a stockbroker, which he co-founded in 1989 and advises corporate clients on global financial markets, including investment and FX strategies. Previously at Chase Manhattan Bank and Bear Stearns, he worked in the insurance and investment management sectors. He also served as a chairman on listed and private companies in the UK and Australia. So, Alistair, come on up. <laughs> come and take a seat. Well, I don't really know where to start when it comes to the macro because so much has happened. So, Alistair, how would you characterise 2018 so far? Well, it's all about buona sera tutti. 
<laughs> it's all about. <laughs> Uh, it's all about division, quarrelling, disagreement, breakdown of structures and rules. It's, it's very unsettling. It's, uh, and it's going to go on, not just in 2018. Uh, it's not just Trump. It's not just Brexit. It's not just Salvini <laughs> or, or Gigi. <laughs> Uh, it's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Francis, what would you say? What's characterised 2018 for you? I think we are, uh, shall we say, um, reaping the lessons of um, the mistakes we've made over the last 10 years and possibly even over the last 30 years. There are lots of, I'm mixing metaphors wildly here, but lots and lots of chickens coming home to roost. Um, for example, over the last 10 years, a lot of our attention has been focused upon trying to shore up what already exists and somehow make it continue to work, even though it was fairly apparent to everybody that it didn't work. And m maybe our attempts to shore it up and keep it going are now crumbling because everybody said, oh, for goodness sake, this is ridiculous, can we change it? Um, but there's also uh, issues going back much further. I mean, I think some of the things that are just unravelling now are things that were set up 30, 40 or more years ago. It's almost like the, the post-war consensus is just beginning to, to, to break down. And I don't know what's going to replace that. I, I'm inclined to quote the Chinese on this, may you live in interesting times, which, as we all know, is a curse. <laughs> so, Mike, you've been nodding along. I have, yes. So I agree with, with both Francis and, and Alistair, but, I mean, to try and draw that together in a way... Um, Last 10 years is all, all in about central banks. And in fact, we've had something of a cult of personality grow up around central bankers and... Uh... So we're getting things like RBS introducing a 100 million provision against economic uncertainty, and we all know what that means, really. It's kind of so we have no idea what form Brexit is going to take. We don't, this could even be a kind of a no-deal Brexit, in which, case, in which case March is the definite, definitive date. Um, there is still a, a rising chance of that, just because of the intransigence of everybody. Um, but I do think that once we all know where we stand, I think businesses will be better able to plan, and investors might then be able to take a view about where are the good places to invest. Mm. And so I do actually think things might get a bit better after then. At least for the UK, Mike, I mean, with a, a weak sterling, we're going to have foreign investment in here. Good place to invest, no? Is that a green shoot? I'm trying my best. Well, there are, as we say, swings and roundabouts attached to this. So, so clearly, and this was, was very, very visible in the immediate uh, post-referendum devaluation. Yes, of course, you people are saying, well, you know, for instance, London property. Um, not necessarily my area, um, but, you know, clearly people think, well, this is 20% cheaper than it was yesterday. Let's, um, let's, let's steam in. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, business investment has, um, has been, you know, significantly lower than we would have expected it in the UK, the, uh, you know, this part of the cycle. And clearly, the uncertainty in and around Brexit has played a part in that. And I actually, we were just discussing before we came on the panel that, that this, I say economic forecast, although, you know, I would say economic barn door <laughs> was from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, and they said, well, you know, if we have a soft Brexit, then the UK is going to grow by 1.9%, uh, which is an acceleration from where we're probably going to end up this year, um, and it's pretty much in line with the Eurozone, I would imagine, uh, for this year. That's now, different. or 0.3. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's great. It's great to have these forecasters who just go pick a number, really. But it, 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 does, it just shows the sort of, you know, the, the, the spread of uncertainty that's out there. But actually, I would, I would echo what Alison said in terms of, um, I'm not sure that March will actually be the end. I'd like it to be the end of it, but I'm not sure March will be the end of it because, yes, the Conservative Party is divided. Mm -hmm. The Labour Party is also it's divided. divided yeah. It just doesn't get as much press because they're not the government. And I think that no, none of these parties get le democratic legitimacy, legitimacy in the eyes of voters mm -hmm. if we effectively overturn the, the result of that ref the 19, 20, uh, 2016 referendum. I think we have to go for another referendum there's no time to organise that mm. before the end of March, so we'd have to go for an Article 50 extension. So do you know what? I'm, I can honestly see myself discussing Brexit this time next year. I think people are probably sick of Brexit now, but it's not going away. So I think we're almost out of time. So let's just sum up then. Alistair, what do you want people well, to take I, away? I, I'm not... I'm in I think next 
next year, next 220, will be more of this argument and, and disagreements, <laughs> but not disaster. People will just get on. I don't think Brexit was settled. I don't think, by the way, the dispute with Italy and the EU, because I think um, the EU can't actually start doing much until the Italian economy doesn't grow. It's actually got to happen uh, or not happen. So the arguments may go on, but um, it, 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 it's some down the road. For you who've been traveling today, I hear from Rome today, there's talk of an election in February, guys. Uh, for the uh, for Mr. Salvini wants to to get a bigger mandate to take on the the EU, so that will cheer you up. Did I'm you know sure you want. From Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa so I'm I'm that. not I don't I'm not miserable. It's uh, disastro, you know, not that, but it's not great. Yeah. Francis, what do you think? I think I'm broadly endorsed what Alistair said. Actually, that you know this. Um, uh, attempting to shore it up after hold it all together while it's actually all crumbling is going to continue for quite some time because there are an awful lot of vested interests who really, really want this to hold, to hold together because they stand to lose a lot mm. if it falls apart, which it will eventually do. I am a slight concern that, you know, if you look at the sort of march of history, is that it, the longer we, we try to hold things together when they're actually crumbling, the worse the eventual collapse is. Um, so, in a way, I would rather we actually sort of pragmatically agreed that fundamental change is needed and actually started talking about it rather than trying to pretend it isn't needed and, you know, hastily, you know, sort of batten down all the hatches. Mm -hmm. I just have this feeling that people being what they are, the batten down the hatches approach and try and carry, sort of keep calm and carry on is probably more likely. Yeah. Uh, it could be dangerous, but final word with you, Mike. Yeah, I think France is precisely correct. Um, more volatility, more uncertainty, more geopolitics, geopolit more of the orange man tweeting. Lots of things to look forward to there. Well, let's thank my panel. So, good job. <laughs> Just wait for a photograph, I think. Uh, yes, come on, scooch up. <laughs> Just to make me look so small. <laughs> no, I have heels on. Oh, thank you so much. Now you can relax. Okay, so now we are going to start with the awards. So let me just explain how the awards are going to work. So I'm going to announce each category. I'll then announce or reveal the winners, and they're going to appear on the screen so you'll be able to see them. Uh, the winners then, when I announce them, are invited to come up on stage. Now, you can either come on your own or bring your team as you like. Um, once you're on stage, then um, you'll be awarded your award. And then I would invite you to give a little thank you speech or to, you know, thank your fans, your, your mum, whatever you want to do. This is your opportunity. And then if you, once you've taken your, just wait on stage, take a photograph, and then once you've finished, if you could just go across there, go to the back where that uh, sign is and have your photo taken once again there. So I hope that made sense to you, but we'll, we'll see how we get on. Okay, 